Shana, John Sokoloff with uh, WCBI in Mississippi. Uh, obviously, Juice Wells, you know, transitioned from South Carolina to Ole Miss. Just wanted to know if you had any comments on his departure and what you think he'll he'll bring to the Rebels. Good player. Uh, wish him well, and know he's excited about his time in Oxford. Front row, left side. Hey, coach. AP Stedham, AP Kelly, as we see at Syndicated Radio. Coach, uh, coaches evolve, so what's your present philosophy on playing multiple quarterbacks? <laughs> um, strong, to quite strong would be the philosophy there. Um, no, we've got a lot of athleticism at the position for sure. You know, we played Lenore Sellers a little bit last year along with Spencer. We did that in the Kentucky game uh, as well. Had a little package for Lenore's. It just so happens that this year we've got, you know, multiple quarterbacks and they all bring an athleticism element that maybe Spencer uh, didn't have that wasn't part of his game. So I think every Saturday you do what gives your team the best chance to be successful, but we're very fortunate that we have some quarterbacks that have athleticism and, and bring a, you know, running element along with the throwing element to their game. Right side, front row. Mason Young with the Tulsa World. Shane, just curious uh, for your thoughts on video replay being available on the sideline. What are the pros and cons of that, and how are you kind of looking at that going into this season? Pros and cons of what? I'm sorry. Uh, video replay. Video. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a learning experience. You know, we are fortunate in the sense that, or in the fact that two of our three coordinators on offense and special teams have come from the NFL, so it's not going to be their first experience utilizing it. Jody Camillus, our special teams coach, is a longtime NFL uh, coordinator along with Dow Loggins on offense. So they're, they've got some familiarity with it as well. I think it'll be something that I know some teams utilized it in their bowl game last year. So in some of our head coach meetings, we as head coaches discussed it, some of the things they saw, pros and cons from it. Uh, and it'll be something that we'll all be trying to do our best to, to work through in August. We don't get a preseason game or a scrimmage against another team to test it out. The first time we do it, it'll be for real. Uh, but it'll be neat, um, you know, to have that technology and, and uh, be able to continue to find ways to help our players be their very best on game day. Left side, second row. Hey, Shane, I think at one of the uh, oh, sorry. Uh, at one of the welcome home events, you mentioned that one of the big factors of bringing in Mike Shula was that he had worked with who's Josh what? Allen is what you said, and yeah. Norris kind of fits that. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe your thinking in that and, and bringing him in and what he can do for Lenoris? And yeah, I mentioned with Coach Shula, he had worked with Cam Newton in Carolina, and then he had worked with Josh Allen most recently with the Buffalo Bills. And, um, you know, regardless of where Coach Shula had been or who he had most recently worked with, I would have wanted to bring him on our staff period. I mean, he was the head coach at Alabama when I was an assistant coach at Mississippi State and um, have known him for a long time. Obviously, we're both sons of coaches. Uh, no one has won more games in the NFL than his dad. So just an immense amount of respect for him as a player and uh, excuse me, him as a, uh, a coach in college and then him as a person. But then when you start talking about bringing him in and you look at his background and what he was able to do with Cam Newton and the Panthers, Panthers when they went to the Super Bowl, what some of his work with Josh Allen and, and what Buffalo has done with Josh Allen, being a big body that can run and throw both. Uh, he's been great, been a guy to, that's helped Dow Loggins in our offensive staff room a lot. You know, you're talking about a guy that has – called plays in the SEC and called plays in the NFL in his career. So he's he's been a welcome addition to our staff and <clears throat> brings a lot of great ideas um, to the staff as well. On the aisle on the right. Coach D. Jackson, CBS 42 in Birmingham. You mentioned your dad. and Over the year or so, you guys were honored in Birmingham with the mm -hmm. Saban Award. Can you talk about that and what Coach Saban has meant to you and what it was like for you and your family to be honored? And secondly, well, I've got the mic, if you could – Give us a little uh, background of, of what Robbie Ashford brings to the table for you guys this year as well. Yeah, uh, first of all, with Coach Saban, it was an immense honor for my dad to be honored with the Saban Award uh, and be able to fly over there for the night and be in Birmingham together as a family. Obviously, anytime you see your dad get honored with an award, it's pretty cool. But to be honored by Nick Saban was, uh, was extra special just because the immense amount of respect my dad has for Coach Saban, but what I have for him as well. You know, it was different uh, walking into SEC head coach meetings for the first time in February back in Birmingham and him not being in that room. 
uh, because of what he's meant to college football and how much respect I have for him. And now he's one of you guys here at this event also. So that was a really cool night. And thanks to uh, Coach Saban and, and Terry for, for honoring my dad on that. And then Robbie Asher. Robbie's, uh, Robbie has really grown and done a great job since he came to our program in January from Auburn. He, uh, you talk about a guy that's a great young man, extremely athletic, you know, hence his baseball career, what he's done as a football player. He started games at the SEC. Uh, he's come in and he's helped make Lenora Sellers better, and Lenora has helped make Robbie better. And uh, just a, a really uh, great addition to our program, great personality, great energy, and has done a really good job helping us get better already uh, on and off the field. On the aisle, left. Colin Kennedy, 24-7 Sports. Shane, uh, last year at Teach SCA's coaching school, you talked a little bit about how you learned recruiting lessons at Oklahoma and then brought that to South Carolina. You mentioned you've had a lot of recruiting success now at SC. So what were some of those lessons you learned at Oklahoma as a recruiter, and how have you applied them now at South Carolina? Yeah, it was good for me going to Oklahoma just because, um, you know, I was coming from Georgia at the time, huge state, Tons of Power Five football players that are coming out of high school football programs in the state of Georgia. Not as many coming out of the state of Oklahoma. It just is what it is. And it was a program, or is a program, that location-wise in the, in, the, in the country that you're in the middle of the country. So you can hop on a plane and be in California in about the same amount of time that you could hop on a plane and be in Washington, D.C., and I may get on a plane and fly to Washington, D.C. to go see Kayla Williams and Cale Gundy may have been getting on a plane to fly to California to see uh, Grant Calcaterra or somebody. Um, so just the ability to recruit nationally, but uh, being with Lincoln, Riley, and then that recruiting, the, the recruiting team, it's just a new way of doing things, new way of seeing things, just a, at a program not like Georgia, because that's where I was coming from, like I said, most recently. Um, and then being in a state that – and this isn't knocking South Carolina football. I'm not saying that. It's just it's facts. The, the population in the state of South Carolina isn't what the state of Texas is, and it isn't what the state of Georgia is. So, therefore, there's fewer Power Five players coming out of the state of South Carolina each and every year than, you know, Texas and Georgia and California. A lot of states can say that. So being able to be creative on recruiting outside your state, like we had to do at Oklahoma, um, was beneficial for me coming back to South Carolina also. Front row. Uh, Shane, uh, Brent's entering year three at Oklahoma. Can you talk just about the importance of year three and for you year four, of just building that foundation, entering those year three, year four, in building your program at, at South Carolina and what yeah. Brent's doing at Oklahoma? Yeah, great question. It's uh, When you go into year three, it's it's obviously more and more your team and, you've, and the guys that maybe stayed – behind have moved on we've still got a lot of guys in our program that I think over I think I just said it in the other room it's over 12 players I think that have that were here since 2020 you know so we've got a lot of guys that I didn't recruit that are still here but year three to me is kind of the year where um, I don't want to say everything catches up with you in a lot of ways but it's really the first year bless you it's really the first year where it's like the transition of taking over from the old staff, implementing your guys. It's really the first year of that in a lot of ways. I knew last season that going for us, you know, our depth, I, I, I haven't analyzed Oklahoma's roster from top to bottom, but I knew for us going into last season, our depth wasn't where we needed it to be at every single position just because of, you know, COVID, uh, attrition and recruiting, whatever it might be. And I knew if we could stay healthy, we had a chance to have a really good year. We weren't able to stay healthy, and the year didn't go the way that we wanted. But we got a lot of young players' experience and things like that as well. So I believe for him, year three, um, I'm sure he dealt with some attrition when Lincoln left, and he had to come in and utilize the portal and, and also high school recruiting. And, and this is a year that, you know, those guys that you first brought in, they're now going into their third year of the program. He's recruited really, really well. Those are going to be young players on this year's team like we have. But then you also got to – you know, we do a summer scouting report on on every team. So we did do Oklahoma back in June as a staff, and I'm going through the roster, and I'm like, oh, man, like Woody's still there. And and there's Ethan. I can remember e recruiting Ethan, you know, us as a staff. So you, you've got guys that were there when he got there, but there's just not as many, but it's more his guys, and it's really laying the direction and the narrative for, for, for where they want to go going forward. On the aisle. 
Uh, Britton Ross, all you nightly. I was just wondering, is there any kind of like emotion that you may feel whenever you guys uh, return to Norman this fall? And then what do you think you're going to tell your team to kind of expect um, as they take the field? Um, on the field, you know, you'll play, um, you know, a, a physical, tough football team, obviously being led by Coach Venables. You're going into one of the greatest venues in college football. Um, I don't think the buses come in by the Heisman trophies, but I mean, it's pretty cool when I work there, you drive to work every day and you drive past all these Heisman trophy statues. So, I mean, that's not normal at a lot of places. Um, so I think we don't talk a whole lot about the, the venue or the atmosphere. They'll be excited to go out there as well and, and play a really good team. Emotions, I don't know. I've got some great memories from my time in Norman, some great friends that I made during my time there. So appreciative to Joe Harris and, and Joe Castiglione and, and Lincoln Riley for giving me an opportunity to, to go to Norman. We grew as a family, had a great time living there. Um, I, I sit it in the other room. My, my kids are disappointed that it's an early kickoff because they had all these plans for Saturday that they wanted to do. Now they don't get to because it'll be an early kickoff. But it'll be emotions just going into a place that, that uh, um, I spent three years and, and had a great time. I'll be in that visiting locker room. The only time I was in there was Coach Riley kicked the team and coaches out of our locker room because we weren't keeping it clean one year. So he made us all dress for a week of practice in the visiting team locker room. So it won't be my first time in the locker room over there. But it's just a great venue and great place with great people. And uh, it'll be exciting going back there. But, you know, once you get to Saturday and the game kicks off, it's, uh, it's all about the players and, and trying to focus on how to help them be successful. Second row. Coach B. McCoy LeBounty, WNSP 105.5 Mobile, Alabama. A year ago, I talked to you about Dawn Staley and the way that she affects recruiting, yeah. and that was prior to her going into an undefeated season. What's the best advice that you continue to get her and how she's continued to help you in your recruiting process? Best advice I give her or she's given me? Both. both, both I don't ways. know if I'm giving her much advice. Um, <laughs> no, she's a great friend. Uh, literally just traded some texts with her a couple days ago about some stuff. Um, she, Dawn's fantastic. It's great for me to be able to just watch her coach, learn from her, go and watch her team's practice. Even last season, early on, I called and talked to her about some things, just not, you know, coaching is coaching, coaching is teaching, and it may be different sports, but there's a lot of similarities. So there's a lot of things that I've learned from her. Um, and she's a great friend. She's willing to do anything to help our program. You know, I mean, we had a junior day back in January where we had about 20 recruits coming on campus, and I think eight of them requested meetings with Don Staley. Um, and it was in the middle of her season, so we had to reach out to her, like, would you have time to meet with eight football players? And I think you have a, she had a game the next day, and she's like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, she would come to uh, – she was involved in some of our recruiting weekends this year. She's been to my house to help with a recruit in the past. But we're also uh, – she doesn't need my help, but she's asked me – a couple times over the years to help her, you know, with a recruit that might be on campus, and I'm willing to do whatever I can. So it's a great resource for me to have a, a coach like that that's a colleague, to have a boss and Ray Tanner that won national championships as a baseball coach. You know, it's a, we're all about South Carolina being great and not, you know, I've been some part of some teams or some schools where it's very territorial. The football coach is all about the football team, and the tennis coach is all about tennis, but not at our place. It's a great environment where we all support each other, and, and uh, Don's right at the top of that. Last two questions. We'll go here, then in the back. Uh, coach Beamer, Wyatt Nunn, Can We Eight News. Um, you guys welcome the Missouri Tigers to williams Bryce in Week 12. Uh, what do you see in the team this year, and how can you plan to bring the Mayor's Cup back to South Carolina? What do I see in Missouri's team, or what do I see in our team? Yeah, and Missouri and Eli Drink, what's the squad? Um, obviously, they had a great year last year. Um, you know, that's late in the year, so we'll really dive into them. We did a brief introduction on them in the summertime in our summer scouting reports, but Coach Drinkwitz obviously did a great job, and, and I know they're very hungry to build upon last year and show that last year wasn't a, just a flash in the pan one year. They're, uh, they're eager to compete for championships, and obviously I know they lost the running back, but they bring a lot of great players back as well, and, and uh, they've done a good job against us the last three seasons. So I know uh, Daniel Rickman, the mayor of Columbia, is uh, eager to try and get that trophy back uh, to, to the Columbia, South Carolina, and uh, we've got a big challenge, and 
looking forward to that one as well. Was there a second part? I'm sorry. Is that good? Okay. All right. Gotcha. Last question in the back. Coach Ed Daniels, WGNO New Orleans. We've seen Spencer practice several times in uh-huh. OTA's minicamp. I'm, I'm wondering if you stay in touch with him. What has he told you about the NFL experience? And, and why do you think his game will translate pretty quickly to the NFL? Because it's obvious the Saints do. Yeah, absolutely. I don't mean to hijack your show. Can he pass that mic to Ralph back there too? Because Ralph, Ralph came sure. and interviewed All me right. at Virginia That's Tech fine. back in like 2012. So, so you're the boss. He, uh, some may say I'm still a slap, but he really interviewed me when I was a slap young coach as well. Uh, Spencer will do a great job. He's uh, I, I do keep in touch with him. Obviously, we had a, we had three years together or two years together at Oklahoma. Somebody I think the world of. He and his family both. So really proud of him. Uh, He's excited about the opportunity in New Orleans. Uh, Feels like he's going to a great place. Uh, There's a lot of people in that organization that I think very highly of. I'm excited for Spencer to be with them as well. And I know from talking to Spencer and talking to people within the Saints organization, they were very much like you, uh, very uh, pleased with what they saw from him during OTAs and and eager to get started with training camp with him. Sorry. No, it's fine. Okay. Like thank you, thank you, Shane. <laughs> Ralph, Ralph Russo from the Associated Press. This is kind of a big picture question. You know, there's some new rules coming in about coaches and analysts and yeah. what they can do. So it's almost going to be like an un- unlimited coaching staff. I'm wondering how much you have thought about that in relation to this idea that we are also now going to be paying players mm-hmm. and allocation of resources. So when you think about what your coaching staff could be and then – what that relates to maybe would you give a little on the coaching staff side if it means putting more on the player side? That's a complicated yeah. question, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on those things. No, it's a great allocation qu- of resources. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think you're going to see teams get really creative in how they do that. I do believe the NCAA, Ralph, has done a really good job of um, – structuring it where teams can't use that rule to gain too much of an unfair advantage from a recruiting standpoint in a lot of ways. They're going to be coaches. Me personally, and not that this is right, I've always been kind of a less is more kind of guy in a lot of ways. I don't necessarily want an army of coaches and staff where I've been a part of that, and it's one of those, well, I thought you were doing that. Well, I thought he was doing it. Well, I thought you were doing it. You know, I want clearly defined expectations and roles for every staff member as well. But certainly, um, yeah, if it means a great player, we'll adjust the coaching staff (laughs) if we need to as well. But I don't think we're very – if you look at our staff size, Ralph, compared to other schools, I'd say we're on the low end as far as, like, coaches and analysts. I mean, everybody's got 10 coaches, but as far as the analysts. But I've tried to be very uh, strategic and thorough about who those analysts are and not just hire a guy to hire somebody. I mean, we have Mike Shula, longtime coach in that role. Um, we have a Kevin Hubbard, who's a former defensive coordinator at a Division three school in that role. We've got some really good young coaches in that role. You know, So I think you've got – I'm going to continue to learn more about it, how we can best – allocate resources to make our program successful. And, and certainly, uh, at the end of the day, it's about the players on the field for sure.